to begin to pose to the intelligentsia in South Africa and the progressives who came, about 500, uh, to a counter summit in March 2013 when the BRICS Heads of State Summit was in our city. And so we began to put together um, readings that would help people grapple with it. And they were quite balanced. We had lots of pro brick And eventually we got into um, a bigger set of debates when we went to Fortaleza with our allies who come from a traditional mention in a minute, uh, from Jaime Mauro Marini. Marini was one of the great Brazilian theorists in the 60s and 70s of anti-imperialism. And his word, sub-imperialism, we began to come to grips with and worked with some of the uh, key intellectuals in Brazil to put this book that you have here together. Um, and they had another summit in Ufa in Russia uh, this July, so we'll tell you what happened. Bricks from Below was the attempt we were making, and we still are making, to figure out how resistance to what we'll argue is a sub-imperial project might emerge. Um, and there were quite a few groups within this network, uh, mainly the left intelligentsia, but also big social movements and uh, NGOs. And we are very able, I think, to illustrate our argument, the ar key argument in the book. You should still get the book, but I'll give you the quick answer by looking at climate change, world economy, and especially the most important of all, okay, this is just important because it's so easy. This guy, who was just fired after being re-elected as the most important administrator of sports ever, Sepp Blatter, boo, right? And when we saw him in Durban and in the South African cities that hosted the World Cup in 2010, we thought this is a quite a bad omen because it wasn't just South Africa, but Brazil in 2014 and Russia in 2018 that have re-legitimized and funded imperialist soccer. And it's very interesting to think about it because what we know the Sepp Blatter is about what multinational corporations do. They come and loot us. No taxes were paid. No exchange controls were imposed. No democracy was allowed. Um, we were left with basically white elephant stadiums. Um, this is mine uh, that I pay 100 million rand, or it's about 20, about what, it's about 10, $8 million a year, whatever it is, to just maintain the stadium the alien's handbag. It's right next to a perfectly adequate world-class stadium. Some of you, if you followed the uh, 29 common, uh, Confederation Cup where the United States actually played here in the semifinals, will remember this, this was a fine stadium. It was a rugby stadium. You could have added a few thousand seats, but we built an, another one here, and, and that was because we had um, these guys looting us. We, we made a little logo jam of the uh, uh, official uh, logo, uh, to illustrate how it was really Whitey who was taking the money out of South Africa. So this is soccer imperialism, and it turns out from uh, some revelations by a guy who's just across the river in Manhattan, um, a guy called Chuck Blazer, and he confessed to the FBI who did an investigation and, and uh, found that we had given them $10 million in bribes to host the 2010 World Cup. And then we don't know how much Russia and Qatar uh, paid, but as you might have heard in Qatar, the temperatures are sort of well over 100 in the summertime, so they've even had to say, oh, we'll move it to winter. But this was the crew of imperialists and imperialist compradors in soccer, including President Thabo Mbeki, uh, our current president, Jacob Zuma, and the man who was the main organizer, Danny Jordan, and to celebrate this extraordinary uh, arrests, like all of these guys were arrested by um, the Swiss police, in May this year, uh, because Jack Warner, who was the head of the Confederations, uh, the Kafka, the Central, what was it, the Caribbean and uh, North American Soccer Federation, uh, was found to have given this, uh, extracted a $10 million bribe. He gave a million to Chuck Blazer, who, who was a whistleblower, um, in cutting another deal. But it turned out the next day, on 28 May, Danny Jordan, the deal maker, the, the briber, uh, was elected, was selected, the mayor of the fifth largest city in South Africa. So the cartoonists, we have the, actually the best, I think, English-speaking cartoonist uh, in the world, Zapiro, uh, trying to explain now what was this $10 million all about. It wasn't a bribe, it was a developmental gift to our brothers in the Caribbean. And so there was this kind of period of um, hemming and hawing about the bribe and what it meant for South Africa being really integrated into a uh, scam, and the most beautiful moment came when our sports minister, Fikile Mbolula, said, the FBI coming in here 
is an imperialist plot against our mate, Sepp Blatter. And this is, this is pulling the, the imperialism card. Uh, U.S. Big Brother, and, and this is imperialism. So we have a very, very important tradition in South African politics that goes back to the old days of Moscow, and we call it talk left, walk right. There's a capacity by the nationalist leaders trained in the old Soviet Union to uh, use an extraordinary degree of radical rhetoric. You would to think they're hard-boiled Marxists. So we can't account for that bribe, the fact that they later turned out to be gangsters, uh, gangsters, his, his mates uh, uh, Jack Warner and, and, and Chuck Blazer. That's not our problem. We were not sniffer dogs. This is the sports minister. We fought colonialism and imperialism, and we are still fighting it. We will not be collateral damage in the battles in the geopolitical space. Beautiful quote from Fekile Mbalula. He was formerly the African National Congress Youth League leader. So they really train the young comrades up in, in talk left, walk right, which is why it's no surprise that the BRICS are advertised to us as being a force against colonialism, against neocolonialism, against imperialism, and especially in the continent of Africa where it's just been ravaged and chewed up and spit out, right? A piece of raw meat is the metaphor for Africa. But we're asking, well, wait a minute, you guys want a seat at the table. What does that represent? You're not against, you're within this system now. And so we'll have to go and prove that. And as I mentioned when I was here, some of you might have joined us over in um, Dumbo. We had a, a Rosa Luxemburg Fest in, in August. We think some of the theoretical argumentation comes very, very clearly from Rosa, who had studied uh, these very countries of South Africa and Democratic Republic of the Congo, Namibia, that I'll be talking about a little bit. But as I say, it was Marini who updated this to think through imperialism, not merely as Luxembourg did, which is a beautiful sense that capital and the non-capitalist become uh, acutely interrelated, and uh, non-capitalist relations, nature, women, uh, mutual aid systems, uh, pre-capitalist social formations, uh, whatever the state has done to to uh, generate some decommodified social welfare. Those become the subjects of the attack of capital during crises because capitalism periodically bursts out in crises and capital then needs the non-capitalists. This is the linchpin of what Luxembourg has done to explain imperialism. Sub-imperialism is when, as Marini puts it, you've got a, uh, an active participant in this process, collaborating actively with the expansion uh, as the uh, role of a key nation in this process. Um, sorry, I'm going backwards. Let me go forward. So this is Marini, and my own PhD supervisor I would introduce now. He needs no introduction. I studied uh, uh, Das Kapital with, I think, the great master who's across the river most of the time. He's in Chile tonight. Uh, David Harvey. And the argument that David makes is that in the context of this kind of long capitalist stagnation, a deep 40, 50 year over accumulation crisis, the crisis doesn't get resolved, it just, just gets displaced. And that stagnation can take the form of extremely uneven development. This is China in the context of a long slowdown of capitalism, stagnation. Um, but at some points, there are real ruptures, and it's at that point in 2008-9 that some of you began to hear, hmm, maybe there's this new formation that can come up. The, the name BRICS really began much earlier, 2001, from Goldman Sachs, thinking that, that these countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa added in 2010, would be the building blocks of the 21st century. But as David Harvey described this process, especially in the moment of crisis, these were the emerging markets, the, the middle uh, income wannabes that were first the absorbers, but then producers of surplus value. And that was the key moment when we said, oh shit, this isn't working very well for the North. Let's look at the BRICS. And so what at least some people were beginning to say, well, wait a minute, those BRICS have just taken the spatial fix, uh, the spatial displacement of all of that over-accumulated capital. And they are now part of the system and they can be called sub-imperial. And I think between Marini and Harvey in describing sub-imperialism, giving us a theoretical grounding, each developing center of capital accumulation sought out its own systematic spatio-temporal fixes for its own surplus capital by defining territorial spheres of influence. You're beginning to see from the classics, going back to Luxembourg, because Harvey in this book, The New Imperialism, where you find this very much revives Cap uh, Luxembourg's theory of imperialism. And there we have, I think, a much better grounding for considering 
uh, capitalism. And we have, of course, several Africans I'll quickly introduce, like Samir Amin, who thought about the BRICs walking on one leg, talking left politically, but um, accepting economic neoliberalism, walking right economically. Um, and other Africans like Paris, uh, well, Sam Moyo, who's one of our uh, colleagues at our Center for Civil Society, and is a Zimbabwean who's very well known for his work on land. He was the head of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And he describes the BRICS with Paris Yeras as being quite diverse. There are sub-imperialisms, many different types of, of accumulation and class formations. Private blocks, uh, very dominant in Brazil and India. Uh, in China, state-owned enterprises. In South Africa, the critical point is that this is a sub-imperial, not imperial process, because the denationalization of South African white capital, its move away from South Africa at the time of democracy in 1994, especially in 99, 2000, Anglo-American, De Beers, Old Mutual, Big Life Insurance, and I think you drink a beer here. Some of you drink industrial beer still called S.A.B. Miller, and now Anheuser-Busch is going to merge with it, so you're going to have a big monopoly of industrial beer. But S.A.B., South African breweries, is the origins of that. Um, so the denationalization of those companies and the degree of participation in the Western military project, uh, as Yeros and Moya describe, um, is different. And, and you could say there's a schizophrenia to all of this that's typical of sub-imperialism. So it's, it's, it's uneven and diverse. If you look at it from South Africa, I think there are about five key characteristics to this theory that we're, that we're trying to experiment with in this book. First, that in local uh, terms, we've seen neoliberalism uh, dominant. And if you do have in South Africa 17 million out of 55 million people getting welfare, it's tokenistic. It's just small scale. It's not a genuine social democratic redistribution. Secondly, it's a regional platform for accumulation. Thirdly, it's the legitimation of the Washington Consensus ideology and its multilateral institutions. Fourthly, these uh, countries are playing deputy sheriff in many ways in regional geopolitical terms. And then fifth, you can uh, always count on the South African elites to talk left, walk right, because they like to confuse us. They've been doing that the last few weeks with their new foreign policy statement um, and also dropping out of the International Criminal Court on grounds it's northern controlled and they didn't uh, go after, you know, sort of, they're only going after Africans there. Um, but it's basically, in, in reality, a practical conciliation with the overall reproduction of world power. So that's the essence of the sub-imperial uh, project, and it's extremely unequal. That's the point that Marini works through theoretically so well, that, that um, internal, uneven, and combined development is extreme, and you can see that with at least South African Brazil and the others becoming much more unequal. This transnational capitalist class that's emerged, as Bill Robinson puts it, he has a great article in Third World Quarterly that earlier this year, is very, very um, ungenerous. The social spending in the BRICS are very low. I mean, the two that are uh, relatively stronger, Brazil and Russia, uh, um, outweighing the other three, South Africa is only at about 6% of GDP for social spending. And we could increase that a great deal. And today, uh, the universities were in a state of near revolution in Johannesburg, Witz, where I'm teaching half time now. The kids went out on the streets because they just got hit with a 10.5% increase, inflation about six. So they're absolutely taking over the city streets. And they're next, I predict, of a piece on a, the, the conversation coming up tomorrow. Um, uh, going to take Santon, where the bankers uh, are that put the pressure on the treasury not to give enough money to keep the weight, the, um, uh, the, to keep the fees low. And that means really, even though South Africa could spend a lot more, uh, we could quantitative ease, we could, we could have uh, spending, we haven't done so. And yet there is still an aura of anti-imperialism. Here's an example of opportunities that Provide, uh, are provided by the BRICS as a counterpower. The fact that Edward Snowden is alive and well and not assassinated, um, asylum in, in Moscow, that we were promised, we were probably not going to get um, an alternative BRICS internet uh, rerouting away from the US to avoid the NSA snooping. Um, do you remember Obama's attempt to bomb Syria in 2013 was foiled by the BRICS at the G20 meeting? And the um, uh, last year, an attempt to, to kick uh, Russia out of the G20 was foiled when the BRICS said, no, then you're going to lose all of us. Now, the current situation with 
Russia in Syria. I'd love to hear your points of view about whether this is getting a little more dangerous, because when we see the dangers implicit in, in trusting the BRICs to fight uh, the power, for example, the power of internet snooping, well, we see that coming right back uh, at us. In fact, the last few days in South Africa were characterized by new debates about whether the uh, activist groups, Right to Know is, is our main sort of progressive and, and actually leftist group fighting um, against uh, state non-transparency and state broadcasting policies and is being spied on, but was then labeled a tool of the CIA a couple of days ago. Um, the, the point about uh, this whole terrain, though, is that, that the BRICS have um, societies that are also quite uneven. We, we have to grapple with that when we think about resistance. For example, Brazil, India uh, have very high proportions of people who place climate change at the top of their agenda. Uh, South Africa a little bit. Um, actually, China, when asked, uh, what are your main concerns in the world? China, the Chinese people that are polled by, this is Pew and it came out in July, say climate is number one. Uh, Russians put it number two and global economic instability. So let's turn to these two, these two topics, the two most uh, critical worries of people in the world today, global climate change and economic instability. Um, actually, it's interesting because the, the, the parts of the world that don't consider climate change as the most important are the US uh, and Canada, most of Western Europe, and Australia, where, of course, they're extremely high emitters. Uh, they put uh, ISIS as the number one problem. Um, here's, here's where you've got uh, the emitters, those with an historic over emissions, and they include a couple of the BRICs, Russia and our old friend South Africa. South Africa has a huge emissions problem because of the coal uh, that's driving the, the energy, and that energy goes pr predominantly to the mining and to the um, uh, smelting industries, which we want to come back to conclude with. That is, that uh, if you're fighting uh, mining and smelting, you're also a climate change warrior just by the fact that there's so much coal involved in the processes. And these are where uh, the climate debt uh, should be owed. These are the climate creditors, especially, uh, especially most of Africa. Most of Africa inland is going to uh, have temperature increases about four degrees higher than the world as a whole. And that's why we're very interested in the BRICS, because when you see this awful image of an Africa as a piece of raw meat, you might ask, well, where are they going to cook this meat? And the answer is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is where they, they need their seat at the table. So this is, this is our worst nightmare for what happens in Paris. Okay, a few of the faces have changed, right? But basically, it's Jacob Zuma who's going to be there. Lula has been replaced. Barack Obama will still be there, or his representative. Wen Jibao, Mon Mon Singh. What these five men did, the BRICS minus Russia and the United States, in the Copenhagen Climate Summit in 2009 was, as Bill McKibben says, they blew up the UN. They just destroyed any possibility of a Kyoto Protocol that could have been a real serious um, attack on, on the emitters. Uh, as you might know, the Kyoto Protocol had carbon trading, the privatization of the air, so we're not fans of that, but at least there was a binding commitment. But now what they've done was develop a non-binding, a voluntary, they call it pledge, bottom-up pledge. The Orwellian language of Obama's people is phenomenal. But that might mean four degrees for the world, maybe nine degrees for Africa. This is where Africa is burning. It burns unevenly with these sites, uh, especially sites that are extremely vulnerable, like the Great Lakes region. This area here has had six million deaths because of warlordism and, and resource-cursing minerals and so forth. And then you get northern Uganda and Sudan with Darfur, and then in West Africa, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And this is actually a, a, a state, de I mean actually a Defense Department map, because they're beginning to get worried that the climate change will be uh, that devastating. And we were worried because, again, in Durban, which Durban has the biggest convention center in Africa, so this was where the COP17 was held, if some of you here uh, were f at, the, at, the, at the film at the beginning. And Maite and Kwana Mashabani, the, the foreign minister, was the chair, uh, with um, um, Christiana Figueres, the head of the UNFCCC, and they agreed on a program there that will leave about 180 million Africans dead, according to Christian Aid. That is um, a, a massive climate change problem, because the people doing the negotiations were these guys, the big oil and big polluters, coal uh, in South Africa, um, big developing countries, big polluter nations, and the CJ, the climate justice team, was just completely unable to make our points. We have very strong auto-critiques. And it raises the question 
that especially for the big convention in Paris that's coming up, uh, it'll end on December 12, and there'll be big protests that day. Of, that one of the ideas is to, is to block in the delegates because um, they haven't done the job. It's a symbolic thing, because I think we all know what happens when you're a negotiator for the United States or China. or South. You go there to represent the interests of the powerful forces in your society, who are the fossil fuel companies, the industrial polluters, the, 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 the carbon addicted elements. So we're not going to see a change uh, in climate politics when the BRICs take on ever greater roles, especially China. In a way, December will be China and the US and the deal that they make being codified more generally. So um, that means the BRICs can agitate for a seat at the table as we shift from climate to the other big question, economics, world economy, and especially the unfairness of financial arrangements. And there's a, 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 a continual signaling of discontent at the BRICS' lack of influence in the existing Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, and what steps can be done uh, for BRICS to take a seat at the table for development finance. So let's think about quickly two uh, solutions that came out of the BRICS in UFA. One, the contingent reserve arrangement, the other, the BRICS New Development Bank. Now, these are very, very important. This, they may even pull up to 100 billion, and it's meant to be the alternative to the World Bank, and the CRA, Contingent Reserve, is meant to be an alternative to the IMF. And why do we need alternatives? Because these guys are the essence of global apartheid, right? The IMF and the World Bank, the WTO. And the main complaint that you hear from BRICS leaders is, we, the BRICS, don't have power in these institutions. We give more money, and the 2010 amendments to the IMF were supposed to give uh, the BRICS much more voting power, 20% more voting power, and the US, the Republicans, have blocked it. Obviously, Obama wants to do the deal, but those hardcore Republicans are blocking it. Actually, the main losers, if the 2010 reforms, those reforms to increase voice, voice of the BRICS go through, the main losers will be Africans. And we can go into a little bit more detail about the context in which finance has become so important and contesting these institutions is terribly important because what we know is up in this period in the 80s and 90s, especially the 2000s, a big de-link. Finance just got so completely out of control and then started to burst boundaries and now is in a little bit of a crisis. It's moving back. The, the failure of, of finance to continue that ridiculous uh, upturn and the big crash of 2000, which they haven't recovered, led the economists to describe a gated globe because you had more exchange controls being imposed. We're always advocating for exchange controls to stop the rich from taking their money out. But it's tricky because when you look at development finance, this is the single biggest project in the world proposed. It's um, depending on who says it, 80 billion or 100 billion dollars, it'll be a dam in the middle of the African, the Congo, the DRC on the Congo River uh, called Inga, and it's going to take electricity all the way up to Italy and down to Cape Town. So if you can imagine a map of Africa, it's three times bigger. Does everybody know the biggest dam in the world at the moment? It's very, very controversial, displaced one. So now it's called the Three Gorges, right, in, in China on the Yangtze River. This is three times bigger. Uh, the Three Gorges is only 14,000 megawatts. This is 42. But now China's saying, man, we can't really do that by ourselves. We need the US to help. And the big dilemma in this is, can't these countries put on exchange controls to stop the outflow of, of surpluses? So this is the crunch in South Africa, is this outflow that, as I mentioned, is a function of uh, basically the uh, biggest companies, Anglo, De Beers, Old Mutual, SAB Miller, BHB Billiton that used to be South African. And they've just been taking their money out since about the year 2000. They just loot the place. Um, and they've got the third highest corporate profits in the world. We've also got a bourgeoisie that won the world's competition, the gold medal for corruption. This is PricewaterhouseCoopers last year dis describing the, the South African elites as the, the world leaders in money laundering, bribery and corruption, procurement fraud, asset misappropriation and cybercrime. And because we spend so much of our hard currency on basically give them profits to repatriate to London, that's put South Africa's foreign debt at an incredibly high level, which is the same level that some of you, do you remember this guy? Who was he? He did this a lot, right? He said, do not push me too far at this famous Rubicon speech. And that was in 1985, P.W. Borte, the, the last sort of really, really wicked prime minister of South Africa, F.W. de Klerk followed him and was uh, at least 
dismantled it, but you could see what happened when the debt ratios went up high. He had to default. And some of you were out on the streets, right? Were you picketing your big banks here in New York to say, don't lend to apartheid? Um, unfortunately, the Swiss lent, and they, they were able to, to sort of pay that off. But it was so frightening that the biggest businessman in South Africa went up to Lusaka, Zambia, to do start do doing the deal, the sort of devil's deal with the ANC to, to draw them in. They closed the stock market, imposed exchange controls, and actually defaulted on the foreign debt. And that's something that the Reserve Bank is saying, whoops, oh, that's where we are. Same ratio today, our foreign debt, because we're spending so much money in um, uh, popping the profits out to the big companies. Why is this important? Because it's a little bit of a diversion, but it basically tells you why we're going to need a contingent reserve arrangement, right? Because the contingent reserve arrangement um, if there were such a thing in 1985, the bailout needed was $13 billion. With $150 billion debt, a lot of it coming due in the short term, it's going to be much more. So how much can the contingent reserve arrangement pay? Only $3 billion, because the guys that wrote this, you have to understand BRICS as being a collection of liberals in presidencies, and especially in central banks and in the um, uh, reserve banks the, and, and treasuries. And they basically said, we like the IMF. And so if you need our money from this contingent reserve arrangement, you only get 30% of your quota. And after that, you're going to have to go to the IMF to get a structural adjustment program. And those who say the contingent reserve arrangement is therefore an alternative to the IMF are totally mistaken. In fact, it is a, um, an amplifier of its legitimacy. This is also an, another way to think about the ways uh, sub-imperialism pulls profits out. South Africa is not in this range of Germany, UK, France, Sweden, who can pull out huge amounts of dividends from the rest of the world, more than 100%. When you get up to 100% and up, then you're really imperialism. If you're way down here, like Indonesia, the Philippines, then you're in a very um, exploited situation. And there are a few that are in between. What's worrying is that South Africa has increased the f to 45% by looting Africa, which comes back to the topic of our discussion today. Sorry, I knew you, you knew I would get around to it, right? The economics of, of looting Africa. These are the South African companies, the top companies on the stock market that are actively involved in a new scramble for Africa. The old scramble, as you might remember, was the name given in 1885 to the big five countries. Now there's a new scramble. These are the new uh, players in the new scramble the leaders of the BRICS who met in, uh, in Durban in 2013. These are the old guys, right? They met in Kaiser Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin, 1885, and they carved Africa in order to make it more um, uh, rational with legal systems, uh, property rights to take uh, the, the minerals and, the, and, and the, uh, the plantation output. You could basically see them saying, hey, I want that line there, and that way I can put in my port to mine, my port to um, plantation infrastructure, my bridges and roads and, and, uh, and all the rest. So that's the first scramble. And what we're seeing in the new scramble is a land grabbing, mainly led by BRICS. So this study that wears this huge kind of land grab, often for food but also minerals, are BRICS. And when you do look for minerals and you look for oil, you find in Africa it's quite uneven. Uh, much of Africa doesn't the useful part of Africa, Le Monde Diplomatique puts it, would be these areas of minerals, especially this huge swath that comes um, through DRC and down to South Africa, our platinum fields especially. And that's the integration into world trade that the BRICS are going to be supporting, and especially the large infrastructure cross-border projects, because that's where the blockages are, especially if you want to get your minerals out. So let's quickly look at the minerals, because that's where the wealth is, um, and it's in South Africa, and the oil and gas. And so you can find, as I say, these kind of pockets of wealth. Um, and you then that's exactly where our new program for infrastructure development in Africa is going to put $93 billion a year. This is exactly the mapping of colonialism. It's just basically port to infrastructure without properly setting up a, a full infrastructure to meet basic needs. It reminds of this man. Does everybody know Cecil John Rhodes? And if you know the name Stratfor, the private sector CIA, you remember that uh, WikiLeaks helped us by uh, unveiling all the emails and discussions. And I thought they put it quite effectively that the traditional role of South Africa, domestic and foreign interests exploiting mineral resources, but 
if you look at the region, the imperatives of South Africa, even after apartheid, remain the free flow of labor and capital to and from the Southern Africa region, and a superior security capability able to project into South Central Africa. And this is where it comes down to imperialism and sub-imperialism needing military support. Um, so this is a great process in March this year when Cecil John Rhodes statue at the University of Cape Town, the number one university in Africa, prestigious, was, was uh, knocked off. But what we've been worried about is as um, a Rhodes Must Fall movement emerged and has been very active today in Cape Town in demanding an end to high tuition increases. What we really also need is a Rhodes Walls Must Fall because Rhodes set up all these borders in that Berlin meeting. And that meeting, this is the uh, effort of Bandile and Delosi, Rhodes Walls Must Falls to fight uh, xenophobia because Jacob Zuma's son and the king of, uh, of the Zulu people, King Zwalatini, had basically called for foreigners to get out of South Africa. He said they were like lice, and you have to pop your lice and put them in the sun. Those were his very words to describe immigrants. Do you remember in, in April, May this year, there was a huge sort of, um, they dirty our streets, there was a pogrom, and several people were killed, and this is going back to our working class, which, um, like so many, I mean, you have a, a working class with some of these same xenophobic tendencies, can be fired up, and Zwalatini's King Goodwill Zwalatini's argument, we ask na foreign nationals to pack their belongings. And it reminds of the way in which not just Zuma's son, but his nephew, have looted places that are the source of our refugees. And this man, the nephew, has a $10 billion oil deal in the eastern part of the DRC. He's not a very good mining and, and oil man. In fact, the, the last big mine that he ran, he stripped it completely. It's a notorious case called Aurora Mine. Um, so what Jacob Zuma does is to put 1,600 of our troops right there in the eastern DRC, very close to his nephew's interests, to do peacekeeping with the UN. A little bit dubious. They don't um, uh, perform very well. This is peacekeepers behaving badly. 93 cases of misconduct brought against them already. And they don't perform very well with their guns either. These are, peace, uh, these are troops that Francois Bouzizet in the Central African Republic asked Abu Mbeki and then Jacob Zuma to put into the Central African Republic. Um, and this is the way they looked on 23rd March 2013. And sadly, this is the way they looked the next day when they were returned in coffins because they were ambushed as 800. Uh, they killed 800 um, uh, Balaka rebels in the Central African Republic, taking over from Bouzizé, the dictator. So what were they there for in March 2013? Chancellor House, the ANC's investment arm, had a diamond export monopoly. With, uh, that was set up by this guy, Buzizé, with Thabo Mbeki, according to these investigations. Um, what was tragic is that this was the moment that the South Africans were meant to be the gate uh, keepers and gate openers for BRICS investment in the extractive industries in Africa. So this was just such an example. Another example of another tragic case, Eastern Zimbabwe, the biggest diamond field since Kimberley, right, the biggest site ever, uh, and this is the team, some of you might have heard about a great anti-imperialist here, but really he's been about looting his, his country and he works with his apparent successor, Emerson Mnangagwa. So Mugabe and Mnangagwa with top defense people looking at the deal with the Zimbabwe defense forces to loot this uh, beautiful part that's now looking a lot more like a dust, uh, dusty site. And the guy behind it apparently is Sam Pa, who's Chinese, works out of Hong Kong. And I took this picture about two months ago when I went through Morongay. And this is the only thing that's new. I used to drive this route you know, seven or eight times a year. And it goes up uh, the east side of Zimbabwe. And this is the kind of dusty little village town that you get. And this is the center of the biggest diamond field um, outside uh, Kimberley, historically, and these are the diamonds you can see them from the road, but there's just nothing left over. There's no fingerprint. Uh, same for the Russians in Zimbabwe, so lots of examples. The Indians in Zimbabwe in, in the steel company pulling out, leaving a disaster. Now, Zambia is a very interesting case, so just to finish up on the extraction piece so we can conclude with some politics. Another case of a BRICS company, uh, this is um, a guy called uh, Anil Ajarwal, who is the um, chief executive and chair and major owner of uh, Vedanta. Um, and uh, Vedanta is a very interesting case because 
This man went to the biggest copper mine in Africa called Concola, and he bought it for 25 million. And in this picture, and there's a whole video that goes with it, he's out bragging to investors in Bangalore that he took this mine for 25 million. Government was asking 400 million. It was sort of a desperation sale, IMF and World Bank putting a lot of pressure. And he claimed, and he was just bragging about it on the video, it's extraordinary, that he's taking $500 million a year profit from that same mine. This is sort of an example of how extreme uh, this is. Now, the reason I'm giving you some of these cases is because there's meant to be not just an alternative to the uh, IMF, but the development finance to um, extract and to, to do major infrastructure is going to come from the alternative to the World Bank, the new development bank, the BRICS NDB. And we know a little bit more about it from UFA that was launched there, and these are the kind of people running it. His name is Tito Mbaweni. He was the Reserve Bank governor for a long time. I mean, his nickname was the Sado Monetarist. He was one of those guys who kept the interest rates really high just for apparently sadistic purposes. And he's now ready, he said, to finance the $100 billion nuclear energy deal that so many in South Africa are so worried about. It falls squarely within the mandate of the bank to provide such capital for these large projects. An alternative to the World Bank? You know, well, actually, the World Bank wouldn't do a nuclear deal of that nature. Yeah, unfortunately. A fair, transparent, and competitive procurement? Nope. This nuclear deal poses an enormous corruption risk, according to the South Southern Africa faith communities, one of the watchdogs. Happening in secret, it makes the arms deal, the source of a lot of the corruption in South Africa, look like a walk in the park. It's going to be one of these great cases. I like this guy because he's so flippant. And he talks a lot, and so he talked about the BRICS uh, New Development Bank when it was first posed in the Durban summit, and he said, um, this discussion about the BRICS Bank is located, is very interesting, we love things to be located here, but these things are very costly. I'd rather take that money and build the Kucha Africa oil refinery here in Port Elizabeth. He's the chair of a big oil company. So he's kind of dissing the very bank that he's now a director of is very interesting. And we can expect his monetarism and his sense of what banking is to continue, which is basically tightening of belts for the very poor, not for the rest of them. So this is the kind of way in which we've seen development banking emerge. And I could go into a lot more detail about the way in which the BRICS have actually funded the IMF, $2 billion, uh, so long as they're more nasty. Praveen Gordon, the finance minister at the time, used the word nasty to describe what he wanted the IMF to be with this new money the BRICS were giving them in 2012. Nasty to who? The Greeks, right? The Irish, my people. Originally, I was born in Ireland. Uh, the Spanish and Portuguese. So those are the kind of um, aspects of, of whether the new economics from the BRICS are going to be any different or just more ex extreme. The, the worst case, I think, was the finance minister in 2009, Trevor Manuel. He arranged a $750 billion recapitalization so that the, um, uh, of the IMF so that the business as usual, the issuing of SDRs, getting through the big economic crisis of 2008. I call that not breaking the chains, but polishing the chains of global economic apartheid. And as I say, the BRICS are the main reason that African votes at the IMF are not rising. Um, financial liberalization, uh, these, are, these are the sorts of, I want to race through so we can get to more of the politics, because not just a myth about Africa rising under the conditions of extractivism, that's not happening. What I'd like to conclude with is African protests are rising. And this gives me the most faith in the sense that as extraction intensifies, even with commodity prices crashing, any corporate social responsibility funding um, will, will not be made. Instead, we've got um, a more extreme and in, uh, intensive mode of extraction and resistance. And you could say, well, yeah, sure, Patrick, protests rose in 2011. That was called the Arab Spring in North Africa, Tunisia, and Egypt, and Libya. But actually, the protests kept going up for socioeconomic reasons. So it's a very interesting uh, politics at the moment. They've just gone down a little bit, but I think that 2015 will be, will be uh, clear, partly because we've just seen again uh, the last couple of weeks this country where this great heroic Thomas Sankara ruled in the 80s before being assassinated. The man who assassinated him and arranged his death, it's becoming more evident now, Blaise Compar was tossed out in this amazing moment in November 2014. Do you remember that? A mass of people just got out, just like they did in, in Tunisia against Ben Ali in, in Egypt with Mubarak to get rid of Blaise Compar. And then 
a couple of weeks ago, one of or late September, one of his um, one of his um, generals, Kumpar's generals, tried to have a coup, and, and then the people again got to the streets and kicked him out again. Another set of protests that are very interesting are the food riots uh, that occur with this sort of speculative bubbles in commodities. But I'd like to conclude with a couple more examples closer to home. Some of you um, are very interested in labor in this room, right? And you'll be interested that the Global Competitiveness Report, uh, every year from the World Economic Forum, rates your labor movement. I didn't put the US on this because it would be embarrassing for you, but this is the ratings of the most militant labor movements in the world. And the African movements are amongst the most militant. One uh, of these reports came out two weeks ago, um, at the 2015-16 from, do you know this group, right? The World Economic Forum, they even had a meeting in New York 2002. But the, yet again, the fourth year in a row, the gold medal for the class struggle goes to the South African working class, yay. <laughs> so that's a wonderful reflection of the sustained power since the Marikana massacre of angry workers. But of all of these, you'll see many, many, I think we could find the United States somewhere, somewhere down near the bottom round, UK. Oh, there we are, thanks. So, okay, your workers have to stop being such slackers, right? Um, so this gold medal to South Africa also reflects extreme support from the rest of the African team here. Lots of African countries have militant working classes. They're very small. They're not in the industries. They're mostly in, in uh, either services or state. Uh, but they're also in the mines to the extent they can. And this is why in the mines and in the infrastructure debates going on, we see lots of resistance. So the little film sc uh, screening at the beginning here called um, The Shore Break will be showing on Friday at the uh, Margaret Mead Film Festival. Who, who knows your film festivals here? Do you know where the Margaret Mead Film Festival is? It's in one of, that's exactly right. Thank you very much. So Friday, please go to see the shore break. One of my colleagues, Nonchle uh, Mbatuma, is, is the heroine of that. But these mines are popping up everywhere, um, very coincidental with uh, conflicts. So these are armed conflicts and mines, and the correlation is very, very clear. And what we've tried to do, my colleague Khadija Sharif has done some detailed mapping of um, explicit struggles against extractivism. So for those of you who've come tonight because you're part of the, the series on extractivism, you probably already know EJOL, the Environmental Justice Organizations, Liabilities and Trade Network, has an atlas that goes into very, very fine detail. You can hone in and see wonderful data about each of these. And Friedrich Ebert Stifting has actually done a, uh, from this New York office a very interesting survey as well. I'll conclude with where I think it's going. Everybody probably knows this name, right? Carl Polanyi. And Michael Burroway, a sociologist at Berkeley, has done some updates about not just these old, wonderful, red, social democratic labor struggles, um, Keynesian social democracy struggles, but now, given our ecological catastrophe, the necessity that the next double movement, right, the sort of resistance from below to neoliberalism from above, the essence of Polanyi's argument. And I think they're very well argued where I'd like to conclude, which is that climate could help us connect very explicitly these anti-extractivist movements um, with, with the big movement that's going to need to challenge everything within capitalism. The deep changes required, Naomi Klein says, should not be viewed as punishments to fear, but a kind of gift. It's time to stop running from the full implications of the climate crisis and endorse new energy systems, renewables, transport systems, public and localized production that doesn't require global transport, urban forms that will be more compact, not sprawling American-style suburbs, houses and services, um, agricultural systems to organic, away from uh, fertilizer, pesticide, and cow-centric, production systems that would be more eco-socialist, cooperative, consumption that would um, move away from the advertisement-driven, high-carbon, import-intensive, materialistic system to decommodified ba meeting of basic needs, disposal systems that would be more zero waste in their philosophy, health, education, arts, social policy, social private space. Those are the things that I think the struggle to link anti-extractivism to the climate movement are going to throw up. So I'd like to end with that and think, well, what do you think? I mean, what I'd love to see if you remember the the fir uh, first film we showed is that the companies from BRICS, one of them Transnet, threatening my neighborhood of South Durban with an expansive, huge import of the Port Petrochemical Complex, they're coming to New York to raise money. 
They're raising bonds. So do plenty of the other BRICS companies. So even if they're not headquartered here or have listings on the New York Stock Exchange, you could be part of a sanctions movement, a movement, by the way, that is working so well, BDS against Israel, that's working against fossil fuel through uh, 350.org and some of the, the, the activists working on investment. But we'd love to begin to see the sort of muscle against corporates from the BRICS. That would be one of the things BRICS from below has identified. Um, that when you have a company based in China or based in uh, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, it can raise capital now anywhere. We need to have people questioning the raising of capital and hoping that the solidaristic work that you've done so well at, uh, for example, ending uh, investments in apartheid, um, all of the protests that have uh, over the years emerged in solidarity, can also be directed at anti-extractivism where the target would be BRICS companies. And I think it does come together where those companies are also contributing to climate change. Those of you working against uh, corporates that are, are wrecking climate policy that are going to take over the Paris Conference of Polluters, COPS21, uh, please also think that if we don't also put the pressure on the South Africans and the Chinese and the Russians who dropped out of Kyoto and the Brazilians and Indians, they'll just go right back as they did in 2009 and do a deal that will uh, ensure planetary disaster. So those would be the things that I think I'm asking you back. What do you uh, believe we should be doing in uh, solidarity together? I ask that because one of the biggest challenges has got to be understanding how to deal with Russia's expansion and China's expansion in the South China Sea, if you live on that side of the world, um, and the geopolitical tensions that are emerging. Is this going to be another case where the US dreams up an enemy, bombs it to smithereens and can't find the weapons of mass destruction? Or is there a genuine problem? And if uh, you don't want to see Obama or wh whoever succeeds him at the helm, what are going to be some progressive political answers to this sort of potentially inter-imperial, but what I still think is based on a, a broad function of these countries laid out in this wonderful new book, The Problem of Sub-Imperial Bricks. So let's hear from you now. Thanks. Because we're live streaming, to be courteous to our live stream audience, I have to run around with the microphone. I also just wanted, picking up on one of the last points that Patrick made in terms of working class militancy, I'd invite people, hopefully the trains will be running, um, to come back on Thursday to hear Manny Ness talk about the Southern insurgency, um, the coming of the global working class. And he has done work in South Africa and many other BRICS and other non-BRICS countries, but it's going to be talking about class struggle, so following up with that theme. So I'm just going to play, um, I don't know, Phil Donahue, Oprah here, and run the mic around to people who want to ask questions or comment. Oh. Uh, Lisa, you may want to mention that Haymarket has a great special on Patrick's book. Yes, they are um, in honor and solidarity. They are deducting um, the $6 minimum admission price from the cover price of the book. It's $19.95 normally, tonight only $14. So buy up and get Patrick to sign it. Um, walk out of here with a great book to read on the subway home. Let me, let me yeah. Some of the other contributors, just so you know, you're getting not just this uh, rhetoric from myself. You've, and you say, oh, well, I don't need to buy the book. Patrick just laid it out. OK, but you'll need to know what Emmanuel Wallerstein, Achin Van Eyck, a great Indian uh, um, Marxist analyst, Susan Soderberg from Canada, Bill Robinson from Santa Barbara. Do you know Vijay Prashad? Vijay has in the past written pro-BRICS, but he's now kind of got the light. And he's now in our book with an anti-BRICS argument. Uh, Sam Moyo, I mentioned. Judith Marshall on the Vale campaign that's reflective of BRICS from below. Um, Ho Fong Hung, a great Chinese critical analyst. Ana Garcia is our co-editor who uh, is in the Marini tradition uh, with Fortinia Fontes. Um, uh, Einar Braten, uh, Omar Martinez, uh, Baruti Amisi, Omar Alfater, a great German eco-Marxist. So a tremendous gathering that we've s uh, pulled together and we'd obviously like more of you to contribute as we potentially get uh, further volumes, further arguments together. So if you like this line of argument, join us. Thanks, comrades. Hi, uh, my name is Raki. I'm a geographer studying at CUNY as well, as you did. Um, 
Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have two questions because I'm really confused about, I'm actually studying Chinese investments in transport infrastructure, especially in shipping, um, but in East Africa, um, and I'm Zimbabwean, so I, I'm saying that because I feel like really confused about how to understand some of the Chinese investments in, in these big infrastructure projects. And I was wondering if you could um, say more about the the role of the military because I think that's always been really important uh, a central part of how um, a lot of these imperialist relations work but to my knowledge it seems that even though the it seems like the National Defense College that has been built in Harare is kind of exceptional and maybe there's a I think to my knowledge I just know that there's a military base in Djibouti which many countries I mean have have military bases there, but so I was wondering if you could talk more about China specifically as as an imperialist or sub-imperialist power and and the milit and the role of the military in that. Okay. Well, I'm out here in the audience. Anybody want to ask, an, do you want to take another question or two, or do you want to do them one at a time? Yeah, okay. Um, come over here and then we'll come back to Patrick. Sorry, sorry. Uh, my, my name is Johan. I'm a South African. Um, I wanted to know w w what's your take on on people's fascination with Thomas Piketty. There was an interesting gathering at the University of Johannesburg, um, and it was quite packed. Um, notably, so it was a, it was a 90% black audience. So I want to get a sense of how necessarily um, that particular class associated with this notion of a middle class, but it's not an ex a real middle class, exactly. But there's a lot of buzz around him, so wh what's your sense of people's response to that? Uh, the other thing recently on my, my, my journey back home, um, I need to stay a, a kind of very, um, like an absolute take on youth politics from our conversations with young people in the NC Youth League. They were just going into their major conference at that particular point in time, and there's been some disturbing voices and noises about the potential of young people to enact change, especially in locations of power. My question, therefore, is what is the politics of this movement of students brought wits to a standstill today? What's their politics? I, 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 I think I have a sense of the ANC Youth League's politics. Um, but also, touching on to, the, on, on to that third point, um, there, there appears to be a, a right-wing right strand I think it manifested itself around the xenophobia, the response to the fee allegations, um, and an almost knee-jerk reaction. How, 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 how dangerous is this kind of right-wing conservative element within the government structure at the moment, in your opinion? Uh, my name is Ali. I'm a follower of Malcolm X. And I was interested in, in watching your description of the uh, South African expansion, what called Sub Saharan Africa. I don't like the term. One people, many different pigmentations, many different. There one, we're in the Americas, Africa, or Brazil, which brings me to the point what's, uh, what's Brazil doing? Because I understand in very, very general terms that Brazil's doing to. Uh, South Africa about what, uh, s sorry, South America about what South Africa is doing to the rest of Africa. And I was wondering if you could be more specific. Uh, as I say, very general, but you could be more specific. Okay, great. And what uh, nice accents to hear. Zimbabwean, South African aid coming through, that's wonderful. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, very quickly say what I think is happening now, but I've just been away a, a few days, so the particular um, dynamics, which uh, on Friday we hadn't any uh, reason to predict, would bubble up today with uh, an even more angry, militant, uh, and, and working class uh, black student body taking the streets, the main streets, right, Empire Road and Jan Smuts, right, uh, right next to the university. Wow, it's really getting exciting because it's class politics uh, emerging. Last Friday, 
thousands of the students had surrounded the vice chancellor, the president of Witts University, and got a commitment out of him not to put on that 10.5% increase until there was some negotiation. And was very, very, he was very accommodating. He said, I w we won't prosecute anyone for, for uh, disruptions and for um, there was a little bit of property violence. And, um, and, and what the students are doing tactically is blocking entrances. But they can do that at Vitz at the main campus. There's only three or four that you have to do. But now they're going all around the other campuses. And then the threat is now we'll go to Santon. We're going to go further and take this to the real power. And I'm very, very interested in that. In fact, tomorrow in the conversation.co.za, I think it is, you'll find my um, rah-rah on that. And likewise, when Piketty came, it may have contributed to some of this because a lot of what the student movement had been until the last week or so was a much more a symbolic movement roads must fall, get rid of that damn statue, right? But also a, a race movement, because the tr university, people like me in the senior uh, academic uh, world are overwhelmingly white. The University of Cape Town, 256 full professors. Only five are black South African Africans, five out of 256, and none of those are women. So this is an extraordinary moment to say, yeah, let's ask why is the professoriate so white, and what's the implication? Do they speak the languages of the, so of the society? Yeah, one, English usually. And then do, they, um, do we uh, have ways of, of uh, halting the reproduction of power? Um, and because we have a Communist Party higher education minister, Blade Nzamande, the head of the Communist Party, there's something that's just happened that might change some of what I just described, which is that books are now getting $80,000 subsidies. So I want to look in the horizon and say, thanks to this communist, social scientists and humanities scholars are going to start rising. And that will also, I believe, be the basis for, as in Zimbabwe, there was a guy called, there's a guy there, Ibo Mandaza, who set up SAPES, a, a political economic series of book publishing. So I have a feeling, A, there's a lot to say, and every black intellectual I know is pregnant with a book, but we whites in the top rungs of universities have, have pushed them into journal articles. I know my dear friends at Haymarket are nodding in agreement, right? Fucking journal, <laughs> journal articles, because those are the death knell of any serious intellectual. Because Oh, there's one exception, the Journal of Peace Building and Development, but the editor is here. But, but mostly, you'd agree, right? These multinational corporate publishers are taking our surplus labor and, and just, you know, ridiculous commodification. That said, the real student politics, as they move into class and object to the um, high prices uh, reflect what Piketty has been telling them. So in his visit, which was high profile, the uh, roads must fall at Cape Town disrupted. He was actually kind of beaming in because he didn't get his passport uh, two pages, so he couldn't come for the first lecture. And they disrupted it because who is the host of that one? A, UCT and the elites, and they have a terrible apartheid class structure in UCT. The, the janitors, the security, the gardeners are not paid you know, more than, uh, I don't know, $100 a month kind of thing, 1400 a month, uh, rand a month. And the, the dilemma there, the, the real uh, defender of Piketty, not only in Cape Town but at UJ, was who? Trevor Manuel. And Trevor Manuel, the finance minister, was the one who imposed all of these policies that made the inequality so stark. So what I see that class that you're asking about is now feeling guilty. But also, some of them are so indebted that they're just a step away from going into poverty. And stop order payments and garnishy orders. This is part of the story behind the Maracana massacre, where you think you've got a decent paying job, but now the debtors. I, I gather that happened here too, right? Uh, what do you call them? Predatory lenders with uh, adjustable rate mortgages. What are they? Exploding arms? They explode, the interest rate goes way up. So we're all seeing this extreme debt um, kind of super exploitation. So when you put all of that together, I see a working class and even lower middle class potential to do what Piketty wouldn't do, challenge even the idea of capitalism. For Piketty, when he visited, he was just trying to put the Band-Aid on. So he was strongly endorsed by Business Day, except for a couple of right-wing writers there. Strongly endorsed by a bourgeoisie that says, oh, maybe we have become, South Africa, the most unequal major country in the world. We're going to need to do some, something with Band-Aid and legitimization and so forth. And um, what we've done in, in rebuttal, Chris Malakani at the Witz uh, um, meeting of, and, and some students said, wait a minute, Piketty, you are trying to fix capitalism because you didn't read Das Kapital. 
and David Harvey's made this point really effectively, right? That, um, and so have a whole bunch of others, Michael Roberts, there's a, there's a good group, and two weeks ago I wrote an essay on this in the conversation, and it seems to me if Piketty uh, says wealth is capital, and he made a technical mistake by including housing and wealth, and uh, we can go into the technicalities, but it means his analysis that um, uh, within capitalism there's this inexorable process of uh, increasing inequality, he evaporates from that analysis crisis, capitalist crisis, which means he can't understand housing bubbles, booms and bursts, and so forth. Now those are the kind of politics that take you into questioning capital itself. And Piketty allowed us to raise the limits of what a liberal and Keynesian project can do. Um, in the next couple of weeks, Joe Stiglitz is coming in. A, I think a similar vein will be able to sort of begin to ask, okay, wh when you want to have transparency to solve the extraction problem and change GDP, come on, that's not going to be enough. It's the George Soros theory, right? Just shine some light on the extractive industries and that harsh spotlight will somehow disinfect all the corruption around. And that only goes so far and the failure of things like the Kimberley process on diamonds really shows that, which brings us to the question, what did the Chinese do in, in a place like, uh, uh, Zim well, Zimbabwe doesn't have a port, but with the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, we are just about to issue a report on several of the sites um, Hong Kong, uh, Rio, Durban, where these big port investments, especially in Durban's case, $5 billion of Chinese investment in Transnet. And it's obviously to take the space and to begin to find for China um, these gateway routes and to continue the uh, export of, of cheap goods. I mean, they will certainly hit a limit at some point. And as you all know, there are efforts to do a reflation internally to have infrastructure and Keynesian projects have hit the, the limit and debt crises are bursting out, the housing prices are falling and was it three and a half trillion dollars in stock market values were lost in June. So to me those are the kind of limits of what um, this move into the commercial circuitry, not just the productive circuitry, might uh, happen. So if you're looking at Lomo in uh, Kenya, is that one of the cases? In Tanzania as well, yeah. yeah. So those are the kinds of sites where they're going to probably run into the fake Africa rising, fake Africa middle class. You know, they measure the middle class starting at $2 a day, and so they say there's um, 313 million people in the middle class. So those would be the kinds of, uh, I think, politics we'll start to see. And I think it, it, it is uh, correct that the Brazilian uh, case in Latin America, but Brazil combined with China, um, also evinces these uh, same contradictions. So China and South Africa in the continent of Africa, but Brazil having that gateway role. Where are some of the contradictions? Ecuador, Bolivia, and if you take the most important project for climate, I think people who know the debate about climate debt would agree, it's Yasuni. It's the place in the uh, border of, of Ecuador and Peru in the Amazon that's the most biodiverse hotspot in the world, and two indigenous peoples live there that haven't been um, you know, affected by Western uh, ex uh, contacts. And there's huge amounts of oil, an estimated $10 billion. And the attempts that our activist friends, Acción Ecológica, CONAI, the Indigenous Peoples Network, they've made to say, leave the oil in the soil, don't extract it, don't contribute to climate change, don't wreck this paradise, don't uh, mess these people, the uh, Quechua people. They lost uh, two years ago. Why? Because China was already negotiating with the great leftist uh, leader of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, and as soon as we failed to get a, a big climate debt movement to endorse this project, mainly I think we failed because Correa was doing elite, elite work, not mass work, not going to the masses of people in the US and, and to, to Germany and Norway, the places we would have tried. And because we failed to get the climate debt fund, he then went to China and said, okay, start the drilling. That was about two years ago. There was a big resistance in Quito. 700,000 people signed a petition. But that influence of China and the Brazilians, remember this TIPNIS project in Bolivia, that's very, very powerful. And the tragedy is that left neo-extractivist governments that are sort of petro-socialist, right? Uh, Venezuela, petro-indigenous uh, in Bolivia, petro-Keynesian in Ecuador, are using some leftist rhetoric to justify 
this kind of destructive process. The answer they give is, oh yeah, but we're recirculating those revenues into welfare programs. But I still think there are so many more exciting alternatives that even that line of argument we can interrogate some more. But it does mean we really are faced with a big problem that the BRICS and their companies are amplifying the worst tendencies of imperialism and extractivism. And we have to be prepared not to accept the sort of pseudo-lefty, oh, but they're an alternative, oh, they're going to be anti-imperialist. No, the evidence on the ground is pretty overwhelming. Another round, or do we still have time? Um, yeah, and also just to follow up on that, today at the um, Inter-American Commission for Human Rights, they say they actually, the IA, CHCR, um, the Ecuadorans were presenting today in front of the, commi the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on the issue of extractivism. There was an Ecuadorian women's group. I wasn't able to follow all of what the discussion was, but many of, this is the week that the um, Inter-American Commission is meeting in DC and many of the different delegations from Latin American countries, it seems to be that the majority of them are actually, you know, presenting. I mean, because they don't really have, their governments don't you know, respond, and so they go to these international agencies, which, you know, provide a platform, at least, how effective the IAHCR actually is in implementing change. They haven't been able to stop mining. They haven't, I mean, they can tell the government that they should stop or that the company should stop, but at least it provides, you know, one opportunity for, for groups like Ecuadorans. I was just, because today the Ecuadorans, yeah, to contest, at least rhetorically, and to try to get some kind of international you know, legal rulings to, to stop extractivism. So the, the mass movements that are, you know, in many cases criminalized by their governments have access to those international forums. Uh, Richard Smith, I'm in system change, not climate change. Um, uh, watching your video there, one of the things that troubles me about the anti-extractivist uh, about the whole idea of extractivism and the anti-extractivist movement is that it focuses too narrowly on just that, not on capitalism and not on an alternative society, an alternative mode of life. So you had people there, uh, there was a woman earlier on in the film saying, but we want roads, we need electricity, you know? And, and then when, when you talk, you show this map of, Africa with all these mines and so forth and of course all the mines the extractive stuff is is um, is awful but people need jobs so the problem is it seems that the to me just just observing things it seems like you know when the when people say well we have to leave the oil in the soil and the coal in the hole and you know that kind of thing they don't they ne they almost never like Bill McKibben in this country and I can't say about Africa but McKibben in this country and so forth and you know um, um, Naomi Klein and so forth, they talk about, about anti-extractivism, but they don't have really much to say about an alternative mode of life, which would have to be based on a rat that stuff at the very end, that's what I wanted to get to, about a radically lower level of consumption. And people on the left particularly don't really want to talk about consumption very much. I get a lot of flack from that in, uh, in, in my uh, uh, um, wing of the movement. They don't want to talk about that because that it realizes that it, it, it means that we have to talk about, about completely reorganizing our economy, not based on not just consumerism in the abstract, but almost every product we make, almost everything made in this country and absolutely everything made in China, uh, just has to be, it just has, we have to stop making most of this stuff and completely make a different kind of society based on a truly sustainable level of consumption over the world and that means that means um, uh, focusing on on, on a level of consumption around an, an adequate um, uh, basis for the whole world for the deindustrialization in the north and some kind of development in the south so people can have those roads and electricity but not you know there's much pr if you read the business press there's huge celebration about the potential of consumerism in africa you know the next big thing you know well, this is just, we have to pose an alternative to this. And it's not enough just to say, no, no mining, no oil drilling. We have to say, well, what is an alternative to that? How can people have a decent life if they don't have this? Okay. 
Hey, thanks so much for the, the great talk. I really appreciate it, and thanks for, thanks for the book. Um, I'm really glad you brought up uh, Bolivia and some of the other countries. I was wondering if that was gonna be a little too far afield for this discussion. I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about what you ended on about saying no to extractivism in, in Bolivia. I mean, I totally agree with the analysis. Absolutely true that maybe, you know, a few more dollars go to social programs, but as a percentage, it's absolutely not happening, and they're putting all their money into foreign currency reserves. I mean, there's just, it's not a, a, any programs that are benefiting people in any real way. But I do wonder, when we're talking about like a place like Bolivia versus a place like China or Brazil or you know, some much, much larger economy that, that is facing limited sort of options in this, in this moment, what, you know, I, I think there's ample evidence that there's movements that are saying no within Bolivia. And our solidarity needs to be there. But I think that one of the things that I have more difficulty with is that next step after that, which is like, well, what are the options that are actually available to the Morales regime right now, right? If they wanted to... If, this, if the left grew more powerful and was able to extract a demand beyond stopping extraction, what, what, what are those sorts of demands and what are we talking about for a, a country with the level of development of Bolivia, it, just given the context of where the world economy is? Yeah, I'm going to take one more and then we'll come back to you. It's over here. I'll get you the next round. Let's hand up over here. Um, I'm Nick, I'm a union lawyer. Um, I was curious, you mentioned kind of the increasing protests, labor actions over the last few years. Um, and I know here there's been, I was curious kind of about the levels of labor solidarity in those actions, because I know here, for example, you've started to see increasing uh, coalescence among unions in opposition to, you know, oil pipelines, for example, and other um, things that are going to be environmentally destructive or harmful contributing to climate change while you still have some um, labor unions that would benefit from those projects still opposing that. And I was kind of curious if you see those kind of same conflicts in Africa or if there's increased levels of labor solidarity. Well, great, because I think all of the questions in this round do get solved. And I'm going to do a little strip tease for a second because there's one labor movement called the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, that working, actually you have a very good group here in uh, Cornell University's Labor Center across the river, um, led by Sean Sweeney, and it's a terrific network at Cornell doing exactly that labor climate work. And the big challenge for our movements in South Africa is whether a united front that actually is funded and supported uh, most profoundly, I think, by NUMSA, will it allow that working class uh, proletariat to find a sub-proletariat, or some may say lumpen, and find environmentalists and, and radical community organizers, women's groups and youth, um, and put some big front together. Uh, they might even have a workers' party. That's what NUMSA, the metal workers, have promoted. In the July cover of Monthly Review this year, I, I, I sketch out where I think it's going. And I'm always you know, way too romantic and over-optimistic when it comes to this rumble on the ground of the workers. But that's exactly where it has got to go. And the question, really, Richard, is can there be a just transition politics that um, a million climate jobs movement, uh, which South Africa, like uh, England, there's uh, Jonathan Neal has a great book on, on that topic, but the million climate jobs, to get the metal workers out of these smelters uh, in Richards Bay, out of the big auto plants, uh, get them into more renewable opportunities. Uh, they were good welders, good miners who uh, shouldn't be doing this coal mining, but maybe can help uh, with the mining that is going to be required of, of our, um, uh, let's say, um, biogas digestion systems that we could set up uh, as a sanitation service that would uh, be a, a real flush toilet but then regenerate the natural uh, the, the methane gas back into people's houses for heating lots and lots of creative things so aidc.org.za is where a million climate jobs is and i think richard that would be one of the sites where the base basic needs consumption strategies are really going to be very um, vital because they're the uh, the need for more consumption, right, for the mass of people in Africa. You're right to be dubious about the middle class in Africa, the $2 a day rate, but also the debt loads, the consumer debt is getting so intense and we've seen various uh, you know, possibilities of Occupy style resistances to debt. But um, we, we obviously have to say to the majority of people on that continent and in South Africa, 54% of people live at uh, $1.80 a day and below. So, the, so obviously a higher consumption level. But I like the movements. I mean, South Africa is a very good place to start 
um, questioning the Western consumption norms, the suburban sprawl, the big brands, the advertisements. And so there, there are little pockets of resistance, even against shopping malls and things. But I think if you put this full um, range of terrains we've got to struggle on, it will be with labor at the core, and it will be with climate as one of the, the, the motivating factors that we get anywhere. But it's going to have to be an alliance. And whether that means, Jason, we learn from the comrades in the movement for socialism, because in fact, NUMSA started this. We actually have something called the movement for socialism, right? The Bolivian ruling party's name. And that was a wonderful coalition, right? that Morales, not, not just Morales, but a lot of great uh, coca growers and anti-privatizers and peasants, you know, they were really putting together that sort of coalition. So where did that go wrong? I'd love to hear, I, I read books by Jeffrey Weber, when, you know, there's occasionally really great analyses of that tragedy. And I can't speak, I mean, Pablo Salon is one of my guides to Bolivia, and he was the ambassador here in New York from Bolivia. And in the Cancun negotiations on the climate in 2010, he was the only one who stood up and said, I uh, deny consent, uh, to, I deny consensus to this COP16 um, it was in 2009. And then he was ignored. But that was an amazing uh, moment where that b the greatest spirit of Bolivia shone through. And then he was fired. Well, he quit, and you know the Tipnis uh, campaign was a big uh, part of that. Uh, similarly, in Venezuela, there's a great intellectual, Marxist intellectual, Edgardo Lander, and he's working with Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Quito, fantastic shop there, uh, to, with a, a couple of books that are trying to explain where they think the, the, the left can go to take on board all of the, sp uh, especially indigenous struggles and the environmental struggles against the neo-extractivism. So I'm not sure where these uh, take us, but they show certain kinds of limits, A, running states, and what I'd lo love to have seen was Axion Ecologica in Quito, um, Konai, the indigenous people, winning more uh, support from people like yourselves that, like me, I probably have the biggest climate debt amongst you for my flying around, that we figure out, not as an offset, but how we're going to pay. And the hope there is that uh, there's a V20, Vulnerable 20 group, and they've begun to forcefully put onto that UN agenda, there's loss and damage. Now, I know there's a sleepy, backward little island that more or less went underwater and suffered $20 billion in damage. And the backward people there didn't know much about climate change. I'm speaking, of course, of Manhattan. And that was on, uh, was it October 29, 2012? Suddenly, quite a wake-up call, right? And you had a mayor here, Bloomberg, trying to climate-proof the island. But that moment where we could say, yeah, but we're the climate um, debtors, and those folks are the creditors. We just got hit with... Uh, 20 billion in damage, so, oh, U.S. Congress will pay that, no problem. But who are, who's going to pay for the sinking islands of, you know, uh, the, the, the southeast or the landmass of Africa or the melting Himalayas? Now, I would love that to be part of the next r uh, round of what, what Naomi's uh, been trying to do is to say, how do we finance some of these things, especially in a Bolivia that has no other opportunity? And... Um, I think a climate debt not paid through the United Nations, its Green Climate Fund is being set up to do this, right? Because you know who's going to win from that, the big corporations, the some NGOs, but it won't really get to the people. Some venal elites will take it in the meantime. So there should be ways that a climate debt can start to be paid in the form of pilots. And one of them was this great Yasuni. That was the best environmental pilot, to leave the oil in the soil. Richard is part of a bigger project, a bigger politics, not just climate justice, but to say, well, then the five billion dollars that the Ecuadorian government could use, um, instead of extracting ten billion dollars worth of oil, could then be used in a developmental way to meet basic needs. So there was a bigger politics than just leave the oil in the soil. Um, similarly, in um, Africa, we've got a couple of potential projects. One, a basic income grant for women in a place called Ochevera, Nav Namibia, which Germans have financed which has been incredibly encouraging. There's a great anthropologist chair at Stanford, Jim Ferguson, who's got a new book called Give a Man a Fish, which really gets into this case, Ochevera, Namibia, the, the um, basic income grant. And if you want some details from my neighborhood, um, there's a place where the white rhinos were saved, Umfalozi. It's a couple of hours north of where I live, uh, the oldest game park in Africa, Umfalozi. Uh, and the white rhinos were saved there by expansion of wilderness area. And like in many of these places, there were peasants nearby. They were shoved out. But now the peasants are working with um, their 
um, former sort of opponents in the conservation movement, mainly white and the black peasants, and they've found that in defending conservation and in um, fighting for their own um, uh, uh, community rights to, to stay on the land, they're up against another C, conservation and community versus coal. And the coal companies are moving into this area, a place called Samkele and Fulani, and they're really moving in fast and digging, 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 really awful anthracite. And one of the main peasant leaders actually passed away yesterday of cancer caused by uh, the conditions of this coal company that set up about 10 years ago. Uh, very tragic. But the point is they're in the fight to link climate. Uh, coal community is another possibility for paying a climate debt. So when I fly home tomorrow, actually, um, I'm going to be setting up systems that will allow the movements in that area. I'm working with quite a few people to do this. We have even a crowd crowdsourcing system um, to hopefully fund movements to fight uh, these extractive processes. So I'm uh, very, very interested in asking all of you, like me, I'm in the global north in Durban, South Africa, what do we do with our own climate debts, but not just individually with the guilt we have, but as a systemic approach that empowers uh, activists on the ground who really do these uh, coal face, literally fights against um, fossil fuels. So those are the things we can still talk about over a couple of years, but if some of you, now I think it's getting quite late, if you need to leave, I'll be uh, very happy. We have one more question or two? Okay, great. Short, so we can. So I'm just going to come around this way. Thanks. Um, my name is George Kafensis, and uh, I wanted to just uh, put our attention to another aspect of imperialism. I think uh, it was brought up before, and maybe you can speak a little bit more about it. Imperialism, empire, war. And uh, if you're going to be talking imperialism, you're going to have to be talking war. And uh, so my question is, does the rise of the BRICS have anything to do with war? And um, so look forward to hearing your response. Hi, my name is Mitchell Cohen. Um, I'm concerned about all that whole list that there's a lot of um, capitalist determinism and then anti uh, and post capitalism without the anti capitalism in any of that. And so that whole, you know, that whole thing is moving. Here's some things in my head I think that we should do, you know, that sort of thing without the real thing. And I'm also concerned about adding an M to, to make it brimsk. If and that M would stand for Mars or the moon, suddenly they're talking about mining on Mars, they found water on Mars, the extractivism on other planets. So how is that going to actually, so is it, so the, without talking about capitalism, as other people have said, as the problem, this just gets plugged in to, uh, you know, if they do start extracting from other planets, so that's part of the problem. And the other part, I think, uh, is there's no mention there of genetic engineering in Africa, which, as a result of the US intervention in Somalia and elsewhere, massive plantations of genetically engineered stuff, which should be seen as extractivist, also of the living cell. And that's not being, you know, so somehow that needs to be integrated into it. Thanks, uh, Aaron McCandless from the New School. Um, Patrick, can you give us your quick assessment of the SDGs and any possible entry points you think that, I mean, there's actually four goals, which is pretty impressive, that cover, you know, environment in various forms. So um, your assessment of, of what's good and bad about it. And also the, the process, do you think that uh, the way it was conducted, you know, all the surveys globally and consultative processes and so forth, do you think it enabled greater activism, greater agency, civil, civil society voice to get in? And yeah, any take on that? Thank you. From the UN to Mars to war. Oh, we can go all night, but I think we need to be a little bit more efficient. Yeah. But 
Uh, Aaron, it's, it's interesting. I, for Telesur, I write every couple of weeks. I, the last uh, article I did was about SDGs. I think uh, Aaron and everyone might know that the predecessor, the MDGs, which end this year, had been nicknamed their Millennium Development Goals. But as Peggy Antrobus from the Feminist uh, Economics Network called Dawn said, no, no, they're maximum distraction gimmicks <laughs> because they took our attention away from what's really going on to fight for sustainability and against poverty. And so my, the essence of my argument about, especially your, your concern, are um, civil society forces integrated? Some are civilized society, right? Suit and tie NGOs, they can always get their, their UN uh, accreditation. But it's actually the continual ignoring of the mass-based politics of sustainability and anti-poverty that still stun me that not, notwithstanding the best minds and best will and, and, and good, decent people, you know them so well, Aaron, at the UN, they somehow have to ignore that the land reform comes through the movement of landless people in Brazil and their allies in Via Campesino, or that to get uh, anti-poverty in South Africa meant allowing people to live, meaning you needed treatment action campaign activists to get free AIDS medicines that cost $10,000 a year. 15 years ago, and as a result, you know, our life expectancy in South Africa the last 10 years has gone from 52 to 62 by violating intellectual property rights and getting those generic medicines. Now, you won't find that, uh, that sort of sense of the movements that really make change, as far as I can tell, in SDGs and SDG processes. And even the, the, the sort of global network of the civil society, many of them now based in places like Johannesburg, right, Civicus and and, um, and uh, Action Aid, they're still not um, hardwired enough into those movements to be the v vehicle for the sort of making those voices heard and making an impact. So I still see that UN as a distraction system. And the power relations are so adverse that, Aaron, you can correct me, but I think the last useful thing the United Nations has done, others have some views, was maybe 1987, right? The Montreal Protocol to stop the ozone hole from growing, but on finance, on trade, on Security Council and uh, stopping wars, on um, democratizing multilaterals, on, um, on climate. The UN has been a disaster. We haven't seen a, a, a sufficiently progressive balance of forces to expect the UN to be a vehicle. And I think, therefore, a distraction gimmick is still the best way to understand its work. I, I hope I'm wrong, and you fight me, we'll have a beer, and you can persuade me otherwise. But if you think back, 1987, there was a Brundtland Commission that had some good, strong language about what was wrong. But then you had neoliberalism, and then in the 90s, you had neoconservatism most of the 2000s. I guess you've got a fusion of neoliberalism and neoconservatism in, in the Obama administration. You can't break that, and the power forces behind it, the global compact, the privatization of the UN, the WHO is going you know, to corporates, um, unless we really make that movement happen. And I hope that'll happen in the streets of Paris. And maybe it'll happen in the so-called red line protests of December 12 to, to really say to the delegates, you've done a bad job, so that the discourse that we have coming out of Paris is they didn't do a deal that'll save the world. They did a deal that'll save US and Chinese corporates, because that's really what was motivating it. But anyway, I'm quite cynical about the UN, but I hope those of you who know it much better than me can set me right. And I don't know enough about uh, genetic engineering, but everything Mitch you're saying is right on. South Africa is serving a sub-imperial role with Monsanto as the imperial force in legitimating. There are some countries that have resisted. Um, some of you will know, I mean, Zimbabwe did say we're not going to have GE maize coming through. And even though they were starving, they forced it to be milled first. That's probably Zambia and Angola and Zimbabwe, yeah. So those few examples of, of resistance have to be um, brought forward. I think the main thing was they, they felt they couldn't export to Europe if they had uh, GE uh, uh, pollution. But I think those are the great questions, and South Africa does have a, a wonderful set of, of NGOs, and you're absolutely right, I didn't integrate it well. And I don't know, George, if, if a theory of war, the theory I learned as a David Harvey student, was that devalorization of capital is often a way to think through um, the conditions that make wars ripe. And the um, pr previous centuries' wars did, uh, I think, follow some of that. And David Harvey's concern that the nuclear war may arise, uh, may arise as a uh, logic of devalorization of overaccumulated capital. And the geopolitics, the theory there is that, that each time you, you want to move around that capital, it overaccumulates. And some are going to resist the devalorization. And that's where your territorial blocks emerge. Those are the theories I often will refer to. But war is one of those things that's hard to 
really generate an overarching theory and to say convincingly that the uh, aggressiveness of Russia in Eastern Europe, the you know, Chinese expansionism, um, uh, you know, will, will, or South Africa in the region will cause war. I wouldn't want to go that for, far, but I'd love to hear if you think the argument could, could go that way. I suppose, my dear comrades, in all of these respects, we're always stuck, aren't we, with this um, dialectic of structure and agency. The South Africa phrase is structure, struggle, dialectic. And that's the extent to which these logics of crisis, the logic of capital accumulation, the logic of class formation, comes up and s hits us so hard. I think in the way that, that Polanyi had a you know, pretty good understanding, that, that pressure of, of capital. But there is from below a counter pressure and linking these up and linking red and green is the way forward. I do think that um, South Africa is a brilliant place for me the last 25 years living there. Um, before that Zimbabwe, I studied here in, in the US and I've never found the conditions so ripe and I've never been so optimistic. And when I think that a brilliant publisher that really could understand just as it was getting up and running and published its first South Africa book called Poetry and Protest by my greatest mentor, uh, Dennis Brutus, and then did another book last year that gives you the socio-cultural understanding of the struggle. It's called Reading Revolution by uh, my closest colleague in Durban, Ashwin Desai. And that publisher's there, so buy their books, and although you don't have Dennis with you today, I think you probably run out of stock. He deserves a reprint. Um, we definitely want to keep working with Haymarket and the Commons and uh, all of the climate activists and other comrades who've come. But let's have a drink and give me some more advice about how to understand these things. You've been very helpful. Thanks, comrades. <laughs> Mandla, a way through.